So I want to share a, a thought with us this morning. I am sometimes a bit slow on the uptake to come to things that everyone else has known about for many years. And this Christmas, uh, this is probably true, you've probably all heard about this show for many years, but I discovered a new show. You know at Christmas they like to do Christmas specials of shows that run normally throughout the year. And I happened upon the Christmas special of The Repair Shop. Anyone seen The Repair Shop? Oh, not that many. Not that many of us. Well, let me tell you about The Repair Shop. Uh, it is a show uh, where a bunch of quirky folks uh, spend their time in a big old shed and they fix things that are precious to people that have become broken. And uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful concept. And I've got really kind of like a bit sold on it, like a bit geeky about it. Uh, and I like to watch it and Steve rolls his eyes and he's like, oh, Sarah, come on. But... Um, there was, a, there was a gorgeous episode, I think it was last year's Christmas special, where this chap brings in a battered old trombone. Uh, this trombone used to be his dad's. His dad was a captain in the Salvation Army. And very sadly, his dad died of Parkinson's in his early uh, mid-40s, I think it was. And since the day of his dad's death, no one played that trumpet, it, trombone. It just got put aside. It got dented. It got rusty. It was unplayable. So he turns up at the repair shop, and there's a chap who knows about repairing musical instruments. And he takes this trombone, and there's, it's, you know, there's a bit of drama around it and all the rest of it. But he takes this trombone, and he lovingly, carefully, painstakingly beautifully repairs it and there's this moment where it's hidden under a cloth and the guy comes in and he says oh yeah I hope you've been able to do something with it and there's the big reveal and it's more than he could have imagined it's better than it was when his dad played it and as it happens because they script these things beautifully this guy's a musician too so he picks up his dad's trombone he goes outside there's a whole Salvation Army band ready and they play a beautiful Christmas carol and it's a gorgeous ending and I'm in floods of tears and I'm thinking this is the best thing at Christmas Christmas I've ever seen. This man's trombone is repaired. But there's something else about that show. Like it's not just the heartwarming stories, but it just captured me. Just something about the fact that God isn't in the business of chucking away broken stuff. He's in the business of repair. He wants to fix things. That's what he's about. He's fixing us. He's fixing this world. And that kind of that sort of second layer, I know it's just a TV show, but it's really made me very emotional about the fact that God fixes us and he painstakingly, carefully, craftsmanshiply, is that even a word, wants to take what is broken in us, what has been neglected, what has been bruised, what has been damaged, what has been just stagnated over the years and to fix it. And as I looked at the scriptures um, last night and, and in the previous days, you can see that throughout the, the past, throughout the whole um, scripture, God is in the business of mending broken things. So I just want to remind you of a few scriptures. You'll know them, but it's just good to remember sometimes if we're feeling a bit like, oh, is there hope? Oh, is this all there is? Oh, what's going on? That our God mends broken things. Isaiah 58, 12 says this, your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be recalled repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. This is one of our key Eden verses. We love this because we're all about the physical environment being repaired as well as the spiritual environment being repaired as well as people's hearts being repaired. We want to see stuff fixed, people mended, people set free, saved and on fire for him. Isaiah 61 4 says this, they will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long, de long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. God is in the business of renewal, revival, re restoration. And not just of the, of the buildings and the land, although that's a massive part of it, but for us as well, for our hearts. Psalm 147.3 says this, He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Time after time in Jesus' ministry, he heals people, he sets them free, he gives them hope and a future when they've been written off by society. And then we fast forward to Revelation 22, and the passage is entitled, Eden Restored, which is great. And 22 verses 1 to 5 says this, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. 
On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun for the Lord God will give their light and they will reign forever and ever. That's the picture of the final restoration, the final renewal, the final moment when everything is as it should have been. And for me, that's just an encouragement this morning that God is in the business of restoration. Yesterday at prayer day, two of my Eden team leaders came with massive, massive personal pain. And actually that time that we had after Daniel and Emily shared to pray was really specific, really significant for them. But today they've still got to face that pain. Today they've still got to go to hospital and deal with stuff. And I'm sure that's the same for many of us. And it's good to remember in the face of that, that God can restore, God can heal, and actually take what has been broken and make something more beautiful out of it. God is also about picking us up when we fall, when we mess up, when we screw up. Sometimes brokenness is a result of our own fault. Sometimes it comes as a result of neglect. Sometimes brokenness comes just because we live in a broken world and sometimes it falls on us. But I want to read a little poem to us this morning. You may have heard it if you're a fan of Simon Gilbo because he reads it often. Uh, But if you haven't heard it, It's a beautiful, beautiful picture of God's love for us and how even when we get messed up, even when we fail, even when it's just, it seems like everything is lost, he's still for us. So this is called The Race. Um, If you've heard it before, well, I hope you'll be blessed. And if you haven't, I hope you'll be super blessed. It says this. Whenever I start to hang my head in front of failure's face, my downward fall is broken by the memory of a race. A children's race, young boys, young men, how I remember well. Excitement, sure, but also fear. It wasn't hard to tell. They all lined up so full of hope, each thought to win that race, or tie for first, or if not that, at least take second place. Their parents watched from off the side, each cheering for their son, and each boy hoped to show his folks that he would be the one. The whistle blew and off they flew like chariots of fire. To win, to be the hero there, was each young boy's desire. One boy in particular, whose dad was in the crowd, was running in the lead and thought, my dad will be so proud. But as he speeded down the field and crossed a shallow dip, the little boy who thought he'd win lost his step and slipped. Trying hard to catch himself, his arms flew every place and midst the laughter of the crowd, he fell flat on his face. As he fell, his hope fell too. He couldn't win it now. Humiliated, he just wished to disappear somehow. But as he fell, his dad stood up and showed his anxious face, which to the boy so clearly said, get up and win that race. He quickly rose, no damage done, a bit behind, that's all, and ran with all his mind and might to make up for his fall. So anxious to restore himself, to catch up and to win, his mind went faster than his legs. He slipped and fell again. He wished that he had quit before with only one disgrace. I'm hopeless as a runner now. I shouldn't try to race. But but through the laughing crowd, he searched and found his father's face with a steady look that said again, get up and win the race. So he jumped up to try again, 10 yards behind the last. If I'm to gain those yards, he thought, I've got to run real fast. Exceeding everything he had, he regained eight, then 10. But trying hard to catch the lead, he slipped and fell again. Defeat, he lay there silently. A tear dropped from his eye. There's no sense running anymore. Three strikes, I'm out. Why try? I've lost So what's the use, he thought. I'll live with my disgrace. But then he thought about his dad, who soon he'd have to face. Get up, an echo sounded low. You haven't lost at all. For all you have to do is win, to win is rise each time you fall. Get up, the echo urged him on. Get up and take your place. You were not meant for failure here. Get up and win that race. So up he rose to run once more, refusing to forfeit, and he resolved that win or lose, at least he wouldn't quit. 
So far behind the others now than most he'd ever been, still he gave it all he had and ran like he could win. Three times he'd fallen stumbling, three times he rose again. Too far behind to hope to win, he still ran to the end. They cheered another boy who crossed the line and won first place, head high and proud and happy, no failing, no disgrace. But when the fallen youngster crossed the line in last place, the crowd gave him a greater cheer for finishing the race. And even though he came in last with head bowed low, unproud, you would have thought he'd won the race to listen to the crowd. And to his dad, he sadly said, I didn't do so well. To me, you won, his father said. He rose each time he fell. And now when things seem dark and bleak and difficult to face, the memory of that little boy helps me in my own race. For all of life is like that race, with its ups and downs and all. And all you have to do to win is rise each time you fall. And when depression and despair shout loudly in my face, another voice within me says, get up and win that race. So, that's our Father God. Whether we screw up now, whether we're going to screw up in the future, whether we screwed up mightily before, each time he's in the business of fixing, he just says, get up, just keep going, just don't quit. You've got a race ahead of you, one foot in front of the other. He's cheering you on. Let's stand, let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you are a loving Father. Paul reminded us of that this morning and that's... Uh, yeah, that's the heart of God that you have for us. So Jesus, I pray. Maybe if you just want to put your hands out, let's receive from him, from his Holy Spirit a minute this morning. Holy Spirit, we welcome you here amidst us this morning. And we thank you that you are a God who heals. You are a God who mends broken hearts. You are a God who cheers us on. You pick us up. You put us back on our feet. And you call us to keep going. Jesus, I pray this morning, would you, would you fill us with your spirit? Would you refresh us? Would you pick us up where we're fallen? Would you carry us where we're limping? Would you heal us where we're broken, God? Fix us, Jesus, we pray. We want to be your army. We want to move forward in battle. We want to take this land, restore it and repair it for you, Jesus. And I pray that you would enable us to do that. In your mighty name, I pray. Amen.